Some cars have immense visual presence. Some cars have a provenance that precedes them. Some cars command respect, garnered from a decades-long legacy that they helped found. But very few share all three of those characteristics. And today on TwinCam, this is the Lamborghini Espada. As I'm sure most of you know, Ferruccio Lamborghini was best known as a tractor manufacturer. But the wealth he attained from his business allowed him to amass a collection of incredible performance cars. From Jaguars to Maseratis and Mercedes to Ferraris. He loved his cars, but despite being so fond of his Ferraris, he found problems in them all. Their customer service wasn't up to scratch. They needed servicing and repairing far too often. And worst of all, they were Spartan. Enzo Ferrari was a racing driver, so it made perfect sense that his cars were, essentially, racing cars for the road. But Ferruccio didn't want this. In 1963, Automobili Lamborghini was founded. And the brief was to build a proper Grand Tourer, not a racing car. A Lamborghini had to be able to skip across continents, and the 350 and 400 GTs began the dynasty we all know and love. Three years later, in 66, Lamborghini's team created the Miura, commonly referred to as the first real supercar, with a mid-mounted V12 and awesome Gandini styling. But the Miura was an exercise in flamboyance, it was designed to be radical, with zero compromises in its engineering. The Miura and its successors were built very much as showcases for Lamborghini, because creating something mental is brilliant for marketing. And that line of supercars is very much responsible for Lamborghini's place in the public's consciousness. But in the 60s, it wasn't the centre of their business. Ferruccio's attention was solely focused on the Grand Tourers. And though this caused quite a bit of unrest within the company, Lamborghini was dead set on making the best cars possible. He said, I wish to build GT cars without defects. Quite normal, conventional but perfect. Not a technical bomb. And with that, the 400 GT was still their most important model. For 1966, the 400 gained an extra two seats, becoming the 400 GT 2 plus 2. But the basic car was aging and the rear seats weren't exactly spacious, considering the grand touring focus. And over the following two years, Lamborghini and Marazzi, a coach builder, worked on developing a new, larger body for the 400 chassis. And the car they came up with wasn't the Espada, but the Lamborghini Islero. The Islero was a phenomenally elegant car, but it didn't adequately resolve the issues faced by the 400 GT. It was still far too small. But Lamborghini knew this. And fortunately for them, they weren't the only ones thinking this. In the automotive sphere, Marcello Gandini is something of a household name now. But in the 1960s, he was only in his late 20s, and he was working at Bertoni when they were commissioned to style the Miura. Almost overnight, Gandini had supplied Lamborghini with a phenomenally pretty and strikingly modern looking car. And less than a year later, he was back at it, commissioned to style a Lamborghini concept car that will fulfil the dream as a true four-seat Grand Tourer. What he'd come up with was the Marsal, a one-off that was shown on Lamborghini's stand at the 1967 Geneva Motor Show. It was never intended to go into production, with its intensely wedgy silhouette and its almost full-depth glass gullwing doors. But it was popular. So popular, in fact, that Lamborghini commissioned Gandini and Bertoni to go away and style a production version. The car we know today as the Espada, named after the sword a matador would use to kill the bull. 
While the Aslero was a conservative and elegantly styled car, the Espada is anything but. It takes the attitude of the Mura and places it perfectly within the confines of a big, bruising coupe. The Martial influence is clearest in the front end, and this is virtually a carbon copy of it. But everything behind the bulkhead comes from another 1967 Gandini show car, the Jaguar Piranha, which was a coupe based around the running gear of an E-Type. But it's a striking thing. There's nothing this side of a concept car that takes such a ridiculous silhouette and such an aggressive stance. I love it. This is pure automotive indulgence. The Espada is a huge car by anyone's standards, but it's simultaneously so low that it has the stylistic vibe of what we'd know today as a supercar rather than a sporting luxury coupe. Certainly, nothing Lamborghini had made before or anything anyone else was making held a candle to this in terms of extravagance. And all that begins at the front, because at eye level, the grille and headlamps are hidden below the edge of the bonnet. It's all at knee level, so all you see are the reflections of the mesh and quad lamps in the chrome bumper. And this hiding of its features below its stance and acute angles is repeated in the flared wheel arches, which act to hide the track well within the car's dimensions. So the centre line of the car juts out as if the Espada has huge shoulders before working back in again as we near the sills. It gives the car a delicacy to its proportions that you can't really appreciate in 2D. You need to see it in real life to understand what I mean. But the result is a very wide car that doesn't look over the top. Then there's a side profile. That trim strip flows up from the front, lowering the snout, and it rises further up to the rear, very subtly enabling the Espada to perform that role as a genuine four-seat Grand Tourer, because it has the elegance to restrain and flow where necessary, but the confidence to turn heads through acute angles elsewhere. And speaking of flow, the roofline inverts the side trim and very gently floats down towards the rear, to the point where the rear window is nearly horizontal, and it has to be complemented by a secondary window on the rear panel. And the side window folds upwards, meeting the roofline and allowing it to retain an impression of a compact glass house, as is fitting for a supercar. Then there are the little touches, like the fuel fillers hidden behind the vents on the car's shoulders. But I can't make any real statements on the Espada, because I still don't know what to make of it. The Espada is a 54-year-old car, and I still don't think the world has settled into understanding, never mind tiring of Gandini's work. It's a search for something completely new in car design. Dandini nailed the styling of the Espada, whatever you think of it. Because good design has presence, and good design invokes passion. And whether you think it's horrendously ugly or utterly beautiful, it's that passion that drives attention towards a car. The Aslero and Espada were launched together at the 1968 Geneva Motor Show, and that's one hell of a choice. The two cars shared a lot under the skin, so the option was between the bigger, aggressive, ridiculous Espada, or the classier, more understated and graceful Aslero. I like Elegant, but it doesn't surprise me that only 225 Isleros were built, but 1,217 Espadas rolled out of the factory, becoming Lamborghini's most successful and most profitable model until the Countach overtook it in the mid-80s. And linking those two cars together was the centrepiece of any good and proper Lamborghini, the famous V12. 
Right back in the early days of Lamborghini, Ferruccio needed an engine for his cars, and he attained the services of Giotto Bizzarini, who'd worked at Ferrari in the 1950s, and he designed Lamborghini an all-new V12 that would see production right through to the Murcielago. Heavily revised, of course. Originally, this engine displaced 3.5 litres, but by the 400 GT, that had risen to 3929cc, and that is the same engine that went under the bonnet of the Espada, with six really rather lovely Weber DCOE 40s. And this is an exotic car, built by a company that set out to give Ferrari a bloody nose. So this engine is rather insane. The V-angle is set at 60 degrees, as is standard for most V12s, to be honest, and it has dual overhead camshafts. Still on two valves per cylinder, but it has four cams. It's 1968, remember, and this has an aluminium block, an aluminium cylinder head, and aluminium pistons. And then there are the dimensions. All Lambo V12s are over square, but this one has an 82mm bore and a 62mm stroke. And what an over square design gives you is an engine that revs its nuts off. Not only does this engine make 350 brake horsepower, but it does so at 7,500 RPM. So this whole grand touring thing is slightly offset by a ridiculously racy V12. By the time this particular Espada was built, Ferrari were competing against it with their 365 GT4 2 plus 2. And the V12 in that car displaced 4,390cc, nearly half a litre more than the Lamborghini. But the Ferrari couldn't match the Espada's power output because the 365 was 15 horsepower down and it was less revvy. So despite Ferrari's already rich racing history, Lamborghini's V12 was probably the one with the upper hand. And as is fitting for such a wonderful engine, for the suspension, Lamborghini threw the book at it. The Espada's body is a monocoque, and hanging off it at the front end are double wishbones, and that's repeated at the rear. So we have a chassis mounted differential and an independent rear suspension, plus magnesium alloy wheels, disc brakes on all four corners. The steering is recirculating ball, but all this combines with the silky and flexible V12 to produce a car with a masterful balance of ride and handling. Just taut enough for the driver, but plush enough for their passengers. But let's again take this into context and compare it to a 365. Because that car still had a separate chassis and a live rear axle. So just on paper, the Lamborghini's engineering is streets ahead. And that's very much repeated when we come to the decor. Before we step inside, I first want to address these doors. Because they're massive. Gandini was persistent with his love for gullwings, like on the Marcel, and the first Espada prototypes had huge gullwing doors, but Ferruccio won out on, in the end because he hated them, and that left the Countach to be the car with the mad doors. But despite the huge doors, it's not actually all that easy to get in because it's so bloody low. And in 2022, the Espada remains the lowest four-seater car ever made. I should probably also say, because I forgot it before, these will do 150 miles per hour, over 150. And that made this the fastest four-seater car in the world in 1968. And the seating brings us back yet again to the GT thing, because I'm not overstating the necessity for the Espada to be a genuinely usable luxury car. In fact, Ferruccio Lamborghini once said that the Rolls-Royce is a good car. It is quiet and comfortable and quite fast, but it is too upright and stodgy. In Italy, we need a car with every luxury for those who want to travel far and fast and can afford it. But it must have style and it must be beautiful. That is even more important than convenience. So here we are in the cockpit of the Italian Rolls-Royce 
and my goodness is it less stodgy than a shadow or the like. First of all is the fact that all the proportions feel off in here. Because it's so low, the roof is, I mean, I'm not tall, I'm five foot nine and I have that much headroom. Uh, this is a low car. And in the Series 2 and Series 3 Espadas, they actually lowered the floor by a bit because customers complained that they genuinely couldn't fit in the things. It's ridiculous. But despite the fact that vertically we're a bit challenged, there's a tremendous amount of room surrounding me here because it is a huge car. The 3 Series of Espadas had three different dashboards, and this being a Series 3, it has the later one with this kind of wraparound aluminium style design. It's actually very Ferrari-like, but it's also a lot more luxurious than a Ferrari. So although little design bits here and there may look a bit ferrari -y, the vibe is completely different. The dashboard is littered, first of all, with these brilliant Jaeger instruments. And I love, um, I love dials in cars. I think they're fabulous. So in front of us, we have a electronic uh, tachometer goes up to 9,000 RPM. We have, of course, a speedometer that goes up to 180 miles per hour. To my left, we have a fuel gauge, we have an ammeter and a voltmeter. And then to my right, we have a water temperature gauge, an oil temperature gauge, and an oil pressure gauge. The instrument panel around also has a radio in it, and this is a modern aftermarket one. It does seem a strange place in hindsight to put a radio, but again, it's the early 70s this was kind of par for the course of putting things in really strange places and it just seems as though all the buttons have been strewn about the place because they look they look like they've been placed quite well but then you actually sit here and put your hands on the steering wheel and you realize that you can't see two of the two of the actual dials you can't see some of the switches for the headlamps and the like the wiper switches are down by your knee and all the ventilation is in the center and I have to mention the ventilation because, again, it's the early 70s, cars are very different, and this thing came with air conditioning and power steering and electric windows, all as standard. In fact, I can imagine that on a really, really hot day, an Espada might be quite a nice place to be, at least relatively to old cars, because not only do you have the air conditioning, but those two vents in the bonnet are not for the engine. They're not to cool it, they're not for the air intake or anything like that. They are for the cabin ventilation. Plus, the rear windows also pop out. But in spite of all the lovely little 70s-ness, the idiosyncrasies and the brilliant standard equipment, it's a horrendously flawed driving position because of course it is. It's a really kind of hand-built early 70s Italian supercar made by a company that hadn't been around for, around for very long and as such the steering wheel is huge you know some of these didn't come with power steering so that makes sense it's leather wrapped um, and I should say actually before I do the quality of the leather in here is phenomenal it's really brilliant and the seats are ultra comfortable that's just sculpted just enough to keep you where you are but not to hug you this again it's a GT car it's a relaxed car and all this is just perfect for it. The one bit that does feel a little bit claustrophobic, maybe apart from the headroom, is the huge centre console, um, the transmission tunnel, should I say. That's a little bit intrusive, but the rest of it, you just feel as though you have space around you. And then we can get into the actual driving position. So the steering wheel sits quite far away from me in my ultimate driving position, but it's more than acceptable for where it is. I love the design of this, the leather wrapped. I love the aluminium, the drilled perfect adore it and then we get to the pedal box because this steering wheel is arms outstretched for me driving this and my knees are right up against the steering wheel um because the pedal box is l big but it's very very close to me um it's again it's a driving decision you, you want to drive the car sat like this really really relaxed in it uh, with your knees bent because you cannot sit upright in this car and get comfortable. You end up being catching your knees into the back of the steering wheel. It's just silly, but there we are. But this all does come at a cost because Espadas weigh nearly 1,700 kilograms. Ridiculously heavy for a car in the early 70s. But then again, 
if this is an Italian Rolls Royce, and my word, the trimming, it really does feel like it, then I can't blame a 1700 kilo curb weight. I've got to do it. This is a full four-seater, apparently. Unfortunately, I don't think Lamborghini matched Rolls-Royce on this one. <laughs> but um, here we are in the back. That wasn't horrendously difficult, considering this is, again, the lowest four-seater car in the world. Um, but it's, it's not exactly palatial back here. Uh, there is no knee room. Um, remember, of course, in the driver's seat, I didn't have quite enough room for my legs. And now in the back, I have none at all. Um, but you know what? It's not too uncomfortable. And these were marketed as two plus twos in their day, so I can't complain. But although we don't, we aren't exactly blessed with lots of room. The trimmings in here are brilliant because I've got a little armrest to my right hand side, and I've got a big armrest to my left hand side. Of course, I'm Italian, so I have an ashtray, and of course, I have a. If I can pull it out, I have a cigarette lighter or a cigar lighter, if that's your fancy. There's a speaker back here and just things, ev everything is trimmed in leather, apart from the headlining, I suppose. You have a little grab handle, but the pop-out rear windows, the handle is huge and of course it is trimmed in leather. So again, there is so much luxury in here. This is, the, the, these are the glory days of the luxury car when luxury meant putting more leather on everything. That's literally it. Leather, and ride quality and an engine that sounded immense. Yeah, this car's actually perfect. Can't complain at the legroom. Oh, pain. There must be a better way to get out of this car. Oh. But what we do have back here is a phenomenally large boot. Only the top half, only the glass section actually comes up, which it kind of feels more like a saloon than a hatch, but this is a really, really huge boot. So even though you could only fit two adults and two children in the car, you could definitely fit all they need for a proper continental holiday in the back of one of these. The Espada was central to Lamborghini's being in the 60s and 70s, because while people now fawn over the Miura, it was the Espada that sold in numbers. Because unlike some of its competitors, it was designed to be a proper compromise, a real performance car that can also skip across continents. But I suppose this car really was viable everyday transport in the 1970s if you were prepared to live with the expense and not just in terms of running it because if you had an Espada in period you really really were someone because they were expensive things and for context let's start with something very normal in 1973 um, which is halfway through Espada production and staying Italian a little Fiat 127 was under 900 pounds and then we work our way up a Jag XJ Coupe 12 cylinders of course very pretty, very cool car, was over £5,100. Moving back to Italy, a, um, a Uraco, Lamborghini Uraco, was up at around 8250 The average house price in the UK in 1973 was £9,900. A Series 3 Lamborghini Espada, £12,956. Yeah. But shockingly, that isn't some completely outrageous number just cherry picked from the air. Because a 2 plus 2 Ferrari 365, a GT4, a competitor of this at the time, was within a fiver of that. And these were right in the upper echelons of the motor car. This is kind of as good as it got in that period. The Espada's production would span an incredibly turbulent time in Lamborghini's existence. Back in 1968, Ferruccio was still in full control of his company, with his vision for GTs that would surpass Ferrari's compromised road cars. But in 1972, with the Countach being delayed and the global economy taking a turn, he sold 51% of his company. Only two years on, in 74, he took the decision to sell altogether. 
The company only lasted for another four years before it went bankrupt, and that was the year in which the Espada's story closed. But despite its relative popularity, the Espada has become much rarer than the Mura, and that is thanks to its usability. A lot of Espada owners did use their cars every day, and as a result, they were left outside, they were used in the winter, and they rotted. A Mura, on the other hand, was usually kept indoors in a heated environment, kept super clean, never taken out in the rain. And so while many, many Muras have survived, quite a lot of Espadas have unfortunately returned to the earth. Overall, the Espada fills two different categories. Because on the one hand, as a car, it's phenomenally engineered, shockingly practical and amazingly sensible. But then there's the vibe. The Ferraris of this era were these delicately detailed, curvaceous works of art, whereas the Espada isn't that. It's blunt and it catches your attention in a totally different manner. And I feel that was the whole point of this and the Mura. And these cars are completely responsible for creating the Automobile Lamborghini that we know today. The extravagance and awe-inducing shapes and engines were all thanks to the will of Ferruccio to outgun his rivals and the creative genius of Marcello Gandini. And on that note, thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the video, then please do click like and subscribe to TweenCam as well. I'm forever indebted to my wonderful Patreon supporters, so if you'd like to support me that way, then please do follow the link in the description. And I'll have more videos coming along soon.